By the mid-20th century, multiple factions had emerged in the debate around birth control, abortion, and reproduction. Catholics and other religious conservatives initially allied with the medical community to ban contraception and abortion. They were mostly concerned that birth control would encourage sexual immorality. Another factor in their opposition may have been ensuring their number of members could increase. In the early 1800s, the majority of immigrants were Protestant, and a smaller number of immigrant Catholics would often convert to Protestantism upon arrival. It would be in the last half of the 1800s when mostly Irish Catholics would be immigrating to the United States. There were activists like Margaret Sanger who didn't attempt to promote birth control to any one racial group over another. She gave speeches, opened clinics, and provided materials to almost anyone who would be open to listen, which, as we'll discuss in a moment, wasn't always necessarily a good thing. Other birth control advocates were less concerned with the reproduction of poor Anglo-Saxons or Black people and primarily wanted to target recent Catholic immigrants. Catholics were having larger families and could not easily be segregated like African Americans. The earliest proponents of sterilization also wanted to target these groups. The Catholic Church moved to strict opposition of birth control, forced sterilization, and abortion, not only as a matter of faith, but also in an effort to protect their members who were being targeted. Later in the 1960s, when the Catholic immigrant groups had assimilated into the larger white racial population, welfare policies as well as racism would drive sterilization proponents to target mostly Black and Latina women. For Black nationalist conservatives like Marcus Garvey, the focus was increasing the Black population as a means of gaining political control. His arguments ignored the fact that in many areas where Jim Crow laws reigned, the Black population already outnumbered the white population. Additionally, he underestimated the high infant and maternal mortality rates. More births had not always historically translated into more voters or more political power. Margaret Sanger and W.E.B. Du Bois were the most prominent figures on the liberal side of this debate. For anti-abortion activists, the history of Margaret Sanger is used routinely to promote the idea that the goal of Planned Parenthood is to exterminate the black population. The truth is more complex. Margaret Sanger initially aligned with socialist groups and believed that women had the right to limit childbirth and experience sexual pleasure. However, these groups attracted suspicion in the United States after the Russian Revolution. Seeing these trends, Sanger decided that the way to gain acceptance of birth control was to medicalize its purpose and use. He decided to build consensus amongst the medical community that birth control served a legitimate health purpose. The medical community had collaborated with the Catholic Church to ban birth control before, but now they would switch sides when Sanger would present a rationale for the treatments that allowed them to retain professional control over its distribution. But Sanger's success in mainstreaming birth control came at a cost. Sanger embraced the eugenics movement, which was popular with universities, scientists, and political leaders to provide support for her movement. Eugenicists weren't interested in the idea of female self-fulfillment or sexual pleasure, but saw birth control as a way to decrease the birth rates of certain groups of people. W.E.B. Du Bois embraced eugenics in part while rejecting its more extreme conclusions. Many of his justifications for promoting birth control stem from his belief in the talented 10th class within the Black community. Margaret Sanger seemed to agree with this approach. She never wrote about eliminating all black people, but she certainly felt that poor or less educated people in the community should limit their reproduction. Her most direct attacks were against disabled people. She believed strongly that so-called feeble-minded people should be sterilized. She celebrated the ruling of the Supreme Court case in Kerry v. Buck, which legalized these sterilization programs. Discrimination is a worldwide thing. It has to be opposed everywhere. That is why I feel the Negro's plight here is linked with that of the oppressed around the globe. The big answer, as I see it, is the education of the white man. The white man is the problem. It is the same as with the Nazis. We must change the white attitudes. That is where it lies. When we first started out, an anti-Negro white man offered me $10,000 if I start in Harlem first. His idea was simply to cut down the number of Negroes. Spread it as far as you can among them, he said. That is, of course, not our idea. I turned him down, but that is an example of how vicious some people can be about this thing. I remember addressing a colored church group once. I was staying with a white doctor at the time. They didn't let a Negro doctor introduce me to the people. The white doctor had to do it. That was in Memphis. What hangs over the South is that the Negro has been in servitude. The white Southerner is slow to forget this. His attitude is the archaic in this age. Supremacist thinking belongs in the museum. But even with her belief that white supremacist views were the problem, she was still willing to engage with such groups. For example, Margaret Sanger gave a speech at a Woman of the KKK meeting in Silver Lake, New Jersey in 1926. An anti-abortion rights activist typically point out a quote of Sanger's from a 1939 letter to Dr. C.J. Gamble. 
We do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out the idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. What does Sanger mean by this? There are two interpretations. Anti-abortion rights activists state that this is an admission of Sanger's true intentions. They state that she didn't want the black community to find out that she wanted to exterminate them. Pro-abortion rights activists state that this is an acknowledgement of the black nationalist figures like Marcus Garvey, who were telling black people to avoid clinics and calling birth control race genocide. They state that she didn't want her true intentions to provide birth control access to be misunderstood. Conservative Paul Kinger describes this tension in an article on the website faithandfreedom.com. Was Sanger plotting to eliminate all Blacks? Of course not. But she was plotting to control the reproduction of Blacks and of the human race generally. She was a racial eugenicist. Was she a racist eugenicist? Be careful. What else can be said for certain about Sanger and race? If the person we're describing here was a prominent conservative rather than a progressive icon, this would be grounds for liberals to completely discredit and outright destroy that conservative. Liberals should consider their views of Sanger and what she has wrought. Marcus Sanger didn't promote abortion, but it's not clear whether this was because she didn't support it at all or she felt it was too dangerous given the medical technology at the time. In fact, the primary reason she promoted birth control was to prevent women from seeking abortions in the first place. Planned Parenthood did not perform abortions until 1973 when abortion was legalized via Roe v. Wade. By that time, Margaret Sanger had already passed away. The arguments about what Sanger believed and meant are an example of how difficult it is to form moral judgments about historical figures. Typically, political sides elevate the figures which they believe bolster their views and denounce the ones who don't align with their current values. The questions around the intent of Margaret Sanger's work and her beliefs are important. The current debate about abortion is crowded by two sides who want to promote a view of Sanger that best serves their political objectives. Sanger was not a virulent white supremacist who believed all black people would be better off dead. But she was also not an intersectional radical feminist who centered marginalized women in her work. She was a woman in the early 1900s who believed that birth control was a societal good and used the prevailing and later discredited theories of the time to promote her views. She failed or refused to understand that the definitions of disability and low intelligence were inseparable from racist stereotypes. She mistakenly believed that birth control, however it was dispensed, was a good unto itself. W.E.B. Du Bois also deserves criticism. He attempted to carve out a space for respectable black people and the belief that their achievements could discredit scientific racism. However, this separation only made poorer black people more vulnerable to medical abuse in the decades to come. Women's choices are political. By examining this period of history, we see many groups, conservative and liberal, who are competing to control female reproduction as a means to their political ends.